Hello and welcome to Allergies with Aya, a podcast all about food allergies and related food hypersensitivities. Growing up with food allergies, being a food allergy awareness advocate, studying and researching food allergies, and now working in the food hypersensitivity regulation field, and getting to interact with world leading researchers and experts, I have developed a passion for understanding all aspects of food allergy and other food hypersensitivities. In this podcast, we will be taking a closer look at the science behind food hypersensitivity and dissect some of the misinformation we often read or hear about. We will also hear stories from people with lived experience. My aim is to create a scientifically curious community and to get you interested in the science behind food allergies and other food hypersensitivities. Welcome back to episode two. In this episode, I thought it only really right to start at the very beginning. So the foundation of what food allergy is. I will explain the difference between the three broad categories of food allergy. So these include IgE mediated food allergy, non IgE mediated food allergy, and mixed IgE and non-IgE food allergy. And I will also talk about the immune mechanisms that underlie an allergic reaction, and what the methods are to diagnosing IgE-mediated food allergy. I will focus specifically on IgE-mediated food allergy in this episode. I believe understanding the basic immunology underlying an allergic reaction will really help us to understand the science at a much deeper level when we come to discuss more complex topics such as immunotherapy or the genetic determinants of food allergy. Of course, I will also be sharing stories along the way of my own personal experiences. So what is food allergy? Well, food allergy can actually be defined as an adverse immune reaction to a food protein antigen, also known as an allergen. It occurs when the immune system, which is the body's defence against infection, mistakenly treats an allergen as a threat, causing an allergic reaction. Now, I often get the question, what is the difference between food allergies and food intolerances? And it's quite simple, really. Food allergies are immune-mediated, so they involve the immune system. Whilst food intolerances are generally thought to be non-immune-mediated and involve the digestive system, intolerances are often caused by a lack of a digestive enzyme or the inability to digest food. Okay, so now we understand what the definition of food allergy is. Let's dive a little deeper and really try to understand what are the three broad categories of food allergy. And I mentioned this in my introduction. So food allergy can be classified into either IgE-mediated food allergy, non-IgE-mediated food allergy, and mixed, so both IgE-dependent and IgE-independent food allergy. And IgE-mediated food allergy is the most common type of food allergy. So the majority of the time when people refer to food allergy, they are often referring to IgE-mediated food allergy. And this type of food allergy is triggered by immunoglobin E, so IgE for short. And this is a type of antibody that is produced by your body when an allergen is encountered. Symptoms of IgE-mediated food allergy often arise rapidly, so within two minutes of encountering the allergen. Sometimes it can take up to two hours. 
And the symptoms include an itchy sensation inside the mouth, the throat, the ears, a raised or itchy rash, so this can be hives, swelling of the face around the eyes, lips, tongue, and the roof of the mouth, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and in more severe cases known as anaphylaxis, which can be potentially fatal, symptoms can include breathing difficulties, trouble swallowing, feeling dizzy or feeling faint. Now, I have IgE-mediated food allergy myself, and I'm allergic to tree nuts, peanuts, sesame seeds, and kiwi. And I thought I would share with you a story of the symptoms that I've experienced. So when I was in school, my mum decided to make me a sandwich for lunch, and she had bought my favourite salami. However, my mum hadn't really checked the ingredients, and she didn't really realise that the salami that she had got me was a slightly different brand, and it had pistachios in it. I think she thought it was olives or something. And I remember eating it, and instantly, within a few minutes, my tongue started to swell. And it started to go very tingly as well. And my lips started to swell, and the swelling was almost white, and getting quite, kind of, bigger and bigger quite fast. And I remember also my throat started to feel very tight, and I had kind of trouble swallowing, and I was also feeling very anxious and very scared at the same time. Now, the symptoms of eating pistachio were quite different to another reaction that I've had. So, when I was abroad, I was at my cousin's wedding, so I was at my cousin's henna party. Again, this is when I was quite young as well. And it was actually the night before her wedding, so it was quite a nightmare, really. And again, I took a bite out of a sandwich, and I think this sandwich had either hummus or tahini. Either way, essentially, it had sesame seeds in it, which I'm allergic to. And I took a bite out of this sandwich, and of course, instantly, I understood that this had an allergen in it, and so I spat it out. But it was too late. My lips had already started to tingle, and my lips started to swell as well, and I started to feel very, very sick. And I started vomiting as well. So as I said, these reactions were for IgE-mediated food allergy. Let's move on to the next type of food allergy. Okay, so non-IgE-mediated food allergy. What is it? Well, non-IgE-mediated food allergy is a food allergy that is not mediated by IgE antibodies. So this type of food allergy is generally thought to be mediated by T-cells. And they're thought to play quite a large role in this type of food allergy. This type of food allergy can primarily affect the gastrointestinal tract rather than the skin or the respiratory tract, like IgE-mediated food allergy. And the symptoms of non-IgE-mediated food allergy include abdominal discomfort, vomiting and diarrhoea. In some cases, even constipation. And the symptoms can often take much, much longer to develop, so often within hours to days, rather than those experienced by IgE-mediated food allergy, which often happen quite rapidly following the ingestion of the food. Non-IgE food allergy can include food protein-induced enterotherapy, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, food protein-induced proctocolitis, celiac disease, allergic proctocolitis, Heiner syndrome, or cow's milk protein-induced iron deficiency anemia. So that was non-IgE-mediated food allergy. Let's move on now to the final category, which is mixed Ig-dependent and Ig-independent food allergy. So mixed Ig-dependent and Ig-independent food allergy is a condition that is associated with both food allergy and involves both IgE and non-IgE mediated mechanisms. Some people may experience symptoms of both types of reactions. Atopic manifestations of this type of reaction can include delayed food allergy associated atopic dermatitis or eczema, which can be triggered by T helper 2 cells. And although Strictly speaking, eczema is not thought to be an allergic disease. Many infants and young children with atopic eczema have IgE-mediated food allergy. For example, egg allergy is a common food allergy in children with eczema. 
And so appropriate diagnosis of food allergy and elimination of allergens can lead to improvements of eczema in some instances. Another example of mixed IgE dependent and IgE independent food allergy is allergic esophagitis, esophagitis, EOE for short. Okay, so now we have discussed the three broad categories of food allergy. Let's dive a little bit deeper into IgE-mediated food allergy and really try to understand the immune mechanisms that are at play during an allergic reaction and how this food allergy develops. So IgE-mediated food allergy occurs once a person has become sensitised to an allergen. You remember when we talked about IgE-mediated food allergy and how it was triggered by immunoglobin E, which is a type of antibody? Well, essentially what sensitization means is just the ability to produce IgE-specific antibodies to an allergen. And IgE antibodies have a very specific structure that can bind to the allergen and they're very, very specific to the allergen. So initial sensitization occurs the first time your body encounters the allergen and produces specific IgE which can bind to the allergen. The allergen enters through cell barriers on either the skin, gastrointestinal tracts or respiratory tract and is picked up by different cells, resulting in a cascade of reactions which eventually leads to the production of IgE antibodies. These antibodies can bind to the surface of immune cells, such as mast cells. And when they bind to these receptors, essentially, of these mast cells, this is called priming. And when these mast cells are primed, this is when an allergic reaction occurs. So on second exposure and any following exposure to the allergen activates a secondary immune response where symptoms arise. So on second exposure, when an allergen is eaten, it is encountered by around half a million IgE molecules on the mast cells. And these IgE antibodies bind to the allergen and this causes the mast cells to burst, releasing many chemicals like histamine. Histamine can cause vasodilation, which just means that it increases the permeability in your capillaries, which is your blood vessels. And this can cause fluid to escape your capillaries into your tissue. And this can, for example, lead to symptoms of an allergic reaction, such as a runny nose or watery eyes. Other chemicals are also released from mast cells, and these can result in other types of inflammation too. This is basically how an allergic reaction occurs. This is the immune mechanisms that underlie an allergic reaction. You first have to be sensitised to the allergen, and once you are sensitised, you can then develop food allergy, in which symptoms develop. So being sensitised to an allergen just means that you are able to produce IgE antibodies to the allergen. But it does not necessarily mean that you are allergic to the allergen. It is only on repeat exposure or on second exposure or a trigger might occur which causes you to then develop symptoms of an allergic reaction. Okay, so now let's move on to diagnosing food allergy. The holy grail, the gold standard method of diagnosing food allergy is called a double-blind, placebo-controlled food challenge. Essentially what this is, is a clinical diagnostic method in which you give a patient increasing incremental doses of a food allergen within a set time frame until they develop symptoms of an allergic reaction. And if they do develop symptoms, then you know that they have food allergy. And all double blind really means is just that the participant doesn't know if they're eating the food allergen or if they're eating a placebo. And the person administering the allergen also doesn't know if they're give, being given an allergen or the placebo. And so it just eliminates the bias. Essentially what it is, is you're giving someone increasing incremental doses of a food allergen within a time frame to see if they develop symptoms of an allergic reaction. 
However, of course, as you might assume, this is very, very time consuming and also quite costly. And so it's not really commonly done to diagnose patients as having IgE-mediated food allergy. Historically, a combination of sensitization tests and clinical history has been used to diagnose IgE-mediated food allergy. So sensitization tests just test if you're able to produce IgE antibodies. So a skin prick test is a common sensitization test that is done. And I've actually had one of these before, or I have them quite regularly, actually. And all this is, is the patient is administered by first pricking the subject's skin and then dispensing a solution containing the allergen protein. And if the skin swells, then the patient is sensitised and so they're producing IgE to the allergen. Another sensitisation test is a serum IgE test. And this is a type of blood test that measures the level of IgE produced when your serum is mixed with a solution of the allergen. Now, these sensitization tests test whether your body produces IgE antibodies to a specific allergen. However, as I said before, just because you produce IgE antibodies to an allergen does not mean you have food allergy. And so it's used alongside history conversations to diagnose someone as having food allergy. This is exactly what happened to me and continues to happen thanks to the NHS. So when I was a child, I had an amazing allergy nurse who would routinely see me regarding my allergies. And as I grew older, I actually moved out of home to go to university and I was referred to an adult allergy clinic where I was seen by a consultant allergist. And throughout these visits to the hospital allergy clinic, I routinely had skin prick tests and serum IgE tests, along with conversations with the consultant to talk about my food allergies. Skin prick tests are extremely itchy if you are sensitised to the allergen. And I remember an allergy nurse telling me to roll up my sleeves and then mentioning that I would feel just a tiny scratch and then pricking my skin and adding this liquid droplet to the pricked skin which contained the allergen and I would have to wait in the waiting room whilst watching my skin kind of swell up and turn red and kind of resisting the urge to scratch the skin so it can be quite uncomfortable if you are sensitized to the allergen. I remember I would get called up and my nurse would measure the size of the swelling to predict the severity of the allergic reaction to the food. And I would then have a discussion with my nurse or my consultant about my skin prick test results and also how am I managing my allergies and my reactions. Often we would also practice administering a dummy adrenaline auto injector to remind myself how to use one. And so this is a useful consultation in this regard to be able to remember how to administer one. I would also sometimes get blood taken and later in the week I would often receive a letter detailing my consultation but then also giving me a whole list of test results, um, blood test results, which of course when I'm younger I didn't really understand but as I grew older I'm starting to understand them more. So that's it for today's episode everyone. I'll just do a quick wrap up now of what we discussed in this episode. So we discussed the difference between IgE mediated food allergy, non IgE mediated food allergy and mixed IgE and non IgE food allergy. And we dived a little deeper into the immune mechanisms that are underway during an allergic reaction and the methods of diagnosing IgE mediated food allergy. I also wanted to point you in the direction of my YouTube channel where I will be creating a video on the immune mechanisms that underlie an allergic reaction. And so if you're interested in understanding the cascade of reaction that occurs to produce IgE antibodies, then please head over to my YouTube channel Allergies with Aya to learn a little bit more about this. And that's a wrap, guys. So thank you so much for listening. Please do leave a review and share this podcast with friends and family. You can also follow me on social media, which will be provided in the show notes, as well as everything that was discussed today. 
with citations if appropriate, of course. Now, until next time, thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye now. Now, just a disclaimer that the information in this podcast is for information purposes only and is not intended to be used as medical advice. I am not a medical doctor, so I have never and will never give medical advice. You should always speak to a healthcare provider about your unique health needs. My opinions are entirely my own and do not reflect the organisation's opinions that I work for. Due to the nature of my work, I can sometimes have access to unpublished literature. However, due to confidentiality, I will strictly not be discussing unpublished literature. I only discuss findings from published literature in this podcast. I am not responsible for any claims related to procedures, professionals, products or methods discussed in this podcast and I do not approve or endorse any products, professionals, services or methods that may be discussed in this podcast. This podcast was written and produced by me, Iowafi. Music was also produced by me, Iowafi, using GarageBand.